From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on April 22nd, 2024, from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. On this episode of The Lead, we preview the political week ahead for you and catch you up on the U.S. House passing its foreign aid package, and we get reaction from Senator Lindsey Graham on the Ukrainian conflict. We also break down the biggest issues swirling around the State House right now judicial reform, oh yeah, and elections, as well as energy production in the state. Uh, oh yeah. You're affected by all this, and to make it more fun for y'all, we have Mayon Schechter and the Russ McKinney on. No way. Yes, a little treat for you guys. This is so fun. The lead loves hearing from everyone. That's why I have a voicemail box set up so you can share your thoughts, your hot takes, your questions at 803-563-7169. We love hearing from you guys. Give us a shout. We do use our discretion in what voicemails we play, so... Let us know what you think. 803-563-7169. Welcome to today's podcast. Let's start off with a look at the week. Yes. At the State House, we're looking at the House of Representatives, and there's an ad hoc committee meeting on Senator Tom Davis's medical marijuana bill Tuesday afternoon, and the full Judiciary Committee meets on Tuesday before session. Wednesday afternoon, the Judicial Reform Bill S-1046 is before a Judiciary Subcommittee. Over in the Senate, the chamber is debating its version of the $13 billion budget this week, so they will be tied up with that, though there are some committee meetings also going on. Now for the governor, he has a ceremonial bill signing Tuesday morning at a farm in Hopkins that is giving the keynote address at the State Hospitality Conference in downtown Columbia. Thursday afternoon, McMaster will join Superintendent of Education Ellen Weaver for the Teacher of the Year press conference. Who could it be? Who could it be? And Friday, McMaster and First Lady Peggy McMaster will attend the 50th anniversary of Riverbanks Zoo. It's a celebration event, which means the governor might be holding an animal, so I want to go see if anything happens. Up to Congress, the House is out this week and the Senate is back on Tuesday. On the 2024 campaign trail, former President Donald Trump's hush money trial began Monday with opening statements and questioning already getting underway following jury selection last week. President Joe Biden has campaign events in Washington and Florida this week and will speak at the White House Correspondents' Dinner on Saturday. Our invitation was lost in the mail. Oh, darn it. On the economic calendar, on Thursday, we'll have first quarter GDP numbers. Sounds interesting. Big numbers coming out. Now we're going to stick with Washington for a minute, where on Saturday, the U.S. House of Representatives voted in support of the foreign aid packages that have been approved by the Senate nine weeks ago. The 311 to 112 vote for a $61 billion Ukraine aid package drew cheers on the House floor and praise from foreign leaders, including Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who said in part on Twitter, quote, I thank everyone who supported our package. This is a solution for protecting life. I personally thank Speaker Mike Johnson and all American hearts who believe, as we do in Ukraine, that Russian evil must not be winning. I am hopeful that the bill will be quite quickly passed by the United States Senate and sent to President Biden. We appreciate every sign of support for our country and its independence, people, and way of life, which Russia is attempting to bury under the rubble. America has demonstrated its leadership since the first days of this war. Exactly this type of leadership is required to maintain a rules-based international order and predictability for all nations, quote. The Senate is expected to approve the $95 billion aid package, which also includes money for Israel and Taiwan. Why am I talking about this? We've talked about it before, folks. Global security is national security. It's all connected. We're going to hear more from Senator Lindsey Graham in a minute, but I want to tell you how the folks in our congressional delegation voted. Supporting the measure from our delegation were Democratic Congressman Jim Clyburn and Republican Joe Wilson. That was for the Ukraine vote. Those voting against the aid package to Ukraine included Representatives Jeff Duncan, Russell Fry, Nancy Mace, Ralph Norman, and William Timmons. When it came to the Israel aid package, only Norman voted against the measure, with all other members of our delegation supporting the $26 billion measure. Norman did the same with the $8 billion Taiwan aid. On Fox News Sunday, Senator Lindsey Graham was asked by host Shannon Bream about comments made by Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance in a New York Times op-ed saying that Ukraine doesn't have enough fighters to successfully push out the Russians. Here's what Graham had to say about that. Well, uh, if you want American uh, military members to stay out of the fight with Russia, help Ukraine. 
If they go into a NATO nation, Russia, we're in a fight. So with all due respect to uh, Senator Vance, he's wrong. We were told within four days, Kiev would fall. But is he wrong about the math? Yeah, is he, he's, he, is he's he wrong, wrong about the production? He, yeah, he's wrong our capabilities. about the whole concept that we can't deal with multiple problems. In World War II, we fought the Germans and the Japanese. We have an industrial base that needs to be retooled. But the uh, Ukrainian military, with our help, has killed about 50% of the combat power of the Russians. This is the year of more. They're going to have more weapons, but we also want them to have new weapons, ATACMs, to knock the bridge down between Crimea and Russia. They're going to have F-16s. So this idea, give up on Ukraine, makes the world safer. If you pull the plug on Ukraine because you don't have enough capability, there goes Taiwan. The Ukrainians are fighting like tigers. This aid package uh, has a loan component to it. This would not have passed without Donald Trump. I want to thank the House Speaker and Akeem Jeffries working together in a bipartisan fashion to give weapons to Ukraine to fight a fight that matters to us. And President Trump has created a loan component to this package. It gives us leverage down the road. So this idea that we can't help Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan at the same time, I reject that. As for the upcoming primaries, there's a lot going on with our congressional delegation, but... I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to covering the 4th Congressional District Candidate Forum up in Greenville on April 29th, which will take place at the Greenville County Republican Women's Luncheon. So I'm not going to moderate. I'm there to go cover it. We'll have some of that for you next week. Look forward to that. Also, a little update on the money race. Let's look at the 1st District Republican primary fight between Congresswoman Nancy Mace, former gubernatorial candidate Catherine Templeton, and Bill Young. It's been fierce, folks. On the fundraising front, Templeton raised $461,300 in the first quarter of the year, narrowly beating out Mace, who raised $460,000 in the same time, January through March. Young raised just over $11,000. However, Mace has substantially more money on hand with a war chest of $1.28 million to Templeton's $368,000 with weeks to go until the June 11th primary. Now, over on the Democratic side of the first congressional primary, Michael Moore has raised nearly $600,000 so far to Mac Defford's $282,000, which includes a $25,200 loan. Moore, who also took out a loan to the tune of $65,500, has $125,000 on hand to Defford's $88,000. Now let's go to the State House to discuss more legislation and movements that have occurred over the past few days in Columbia. Perfect. I want to start off by playing this piece by the Russ McKinney on the utility bill that cruised through the House but hit roadblocks in the Senate last week. The massive so-called South Carolina Energy Security Act, one of the most expansive pieces of legislation to be considered by the General Assembly this session, all but collapsed in the state Senate this week. Aimed at ensuring the state has enough power to meet its future energy needs, the measure sailed through the House of Representatives, but many senators now say the 45,000-word bill is too wide-ranging to be considered in the final weeks of the current session. Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey, in essence, put it on hold. It's important that, that we deal with the issue. It's important that we get it right. And because it's important that we get it right, my recommendation is that we spend a lot of time over the fall working on this issue. As the Republican leader and Rules Committee chairman, Massey can control the Senate agenda. He and a growing number of his colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, say the shadow of the disastrous V.C. summer nuclear project in 2017 looms too large over the current energy bill. The bill calls for streamlining the regulatory process, allowing utilities to be able to bring new power generation online quicker. It would also restructure the State Public Service Commission. Appearing before a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee recently, Eddie Moore, with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, outlined the concerns of most of the groups opposed to the bill. It has numerous detailed changes to the regulatory process, and many of its provisions are crafted to overturn specific legal precedents or to predetermine outcomes in cases 
or to procedurally tilt the proceedings towards utility proposals that logically will end up with a rate increase rather than towards consumer protection. A key provision of the bill authorizes state-owned utility Santee Cooper to partner with Dominion Energy to construct a large gas-powered energy plant at Kennedy's in Colleton County. The proposed 2,100-megawatt plant would produce around the same amount of electricity that those utilities had hoped to generate with the failed V.C. Summer nuclear project in Fairfield County. In 2007, the General Assembly enacted the now infamous Baseload Review Act. That law allowed Sandy Cooper and then South Carolina Electric and Gas, now Dominion, to charge ratepayers for the project while it was being built. It went under in 2017 but the utility's customers continue to pay for it. The specter of that debacle is causing many lawmakers to urge caution about the proposed gas plant in Kennedy's. Here's Richland County Senator Dick Harputlian expressing that concern to utility CEOs this week. I don't want another baseload review act. I don't want to undo any supervision. These bills reduce the number of public service commissioners, change the process, um, and... You know, y'all are in the business of making money. We're in the business of making sure you don't overcharge our constituents. So with the omnibus bill in trouble, some senators are looking for a way to possibly scale it down to just authorizing Santee Cooper to pursue the Kennedy's plant with Dominion. South Carolina is growing so fast that it has a critical need for additional power generation. Duke Energy Carolina's President Mike Callahan reminded senators of that need this week. He said Duke, which serves thousands of customers in the upstate and the PD, plans to double its generation capacity in the Carolinas over the next 15 years. The current system, we built that over the last 50 years. And so the pace at which we need to move to meet this demand is really unprecedented. And time, by definition, has a cost to it. So from my perspective, that's why we feel like this would be important to move this now. Joining me in studio now for more on this complicated topic is the Russ McKinney. Russ, welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, uh, we just played your piece. It's very insightful. It gives a lot of the background, a lot of the voices involved in this entire situation. But uh, when you try and like distill this down, can you kind of just tell folks like what the need is for this bill, why they have to do all this together? You know, We're talking about trying to get more energy online in South Carolina. Why can't these ent- entities just go before the Public Service Commission, the regulatory body, just to get this approved? Why do they have to go through the legislature? Well, that's pretty much at the, at the heart of the matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, this bill is a you know, an 80-page bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, it encompasses an awful lot, which is probably going to lead to most of its undoing. Mm. Uh, everything that's pretty much uh, needed can be done now. What state leaders, led by House Speaker Merle Smith, really uh, are interested in is doing things quicker. Mm. Uh, So most of the opposition coming to to the bill is not so much to to stop that we need more expanded energy, is the process. They feel like this is going to skew the process in favor of the utilities which ultimately will not be good for ratepayers who will end up having to pay more. That's that's pretty much the bottom mm-hmm. bottom line on it. And ratepayers have already been through a lot in this state, too, when you look at uh, folks that are with Dominion, formerly SENG, um, and Santee Cooper. But there were a lot of senators who took to the floor last week, prominent senators, to air their concerns or defend the legislation. The massive piece that is this legislation, like you're saying, 80 pages, a lot of ins and outs when we're a couple weeks away from the end of session. Uh, but concerns also included the loosening of oversight and regulations that were put in place following the VC summer plant boondoggle. So kind of walk us through some of those those concerns that folks have. Well, if you the uh, Energy Freedom Act was the big piece of legislation that passed in 2019. Mm-hmm. That was a direct result of the VC summer debacle. The uh, the question of whether to sell SCNG to Nextera, et cetera, mm-hmm. is, you know, if you recall, Dominion ended up coming in and buying it. So the, that Energy Freedom Act mm-hmm. uh, basically uh, zeroed in on processes uh, to make things like VC summer not happen, to make the process be better, make it be more responsive. So many folks feel like this is the pendulum swinging back the other way mm-hmm. in the rush to bring all this new energy online which is needed, Mm -hmm. Uh, the process is going to be loosened too much uh, in favor uh, of the utilities. Yeah, especially when you look back, and you mentioned this in your piece about the Baseload Review Act and how that was kind of pushed through in the same vein. Uh, Fool me once, everyone's like, fool me twice, (laughs) shame on me. Yeah. Uh, But bringing it back to that boondoggle, Russ, um, 
again, you know, we're talking about VC summer, the expansion of that nuclear power plant to the tune of $9 billion. There was fraud involved. There were delays. There was a lot of things we've covered over the years on this podcast. Uh, and if right now, you know, SCNG, now Dominion, Dominion uh, ratepayers continue to pay for those costs, too. So that was something that came up from Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey, who mentioned that it's going to be a tougher pill to swallow. What's the rush now? Maybe we can split this bill into two. Right. Yeah. There, there are two aspects of it. One is to because Sandy Cooper is a state entity, the state has to bless or authorize it to enter into this arrangement with Dominion to build that new uh, gas plant. So that's one thing. And that may very well end up in a kind of a skeleton bare bones bill before all this is over. Everything else is kind of where the rub is coming. Most people seem to be, I think, pretty much in line in support. We need the energy. This is a good way to do it. It's probably a cheaper way to do it than each of them building large baseload plants. But back to the, to the ratepayers, as Senator Massey pointed out, we all live in Columbia. We've been paying for the VC Summer plant for some time and still are. Mm -hmm. Sandy Cooper's customers, because of the Cook settlement back, which put all that on hold, they're going to begin to pay for it again mm. here in another year or so. And that really seems to rub Senator Massey and Senator Nikki Setzler, uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Democrat, uh, the same, that rubs them wrong. And so, Rush, you kind of mentioned a little bit about how this could be uh, split into two, into two bills to go forward. But what do you see the future being? Will something pass before the end of session, beginning of May? Do you think this is going to be something done in the off session? What's your read right now? Well, Senator Massey recommended that it's it's such a wide-ranging bill. Let's, let's come back in the fall and do it. I think they'll probably pass something that would mm -hmm. authorize the joint venture, for lack of a better term, for the, for the gas plant in Colleton County this session mm -hmm. uh, before uh, the May adjournment or maybe put it in the signing die resolution and deal with one of those matters prior to the final adjournment of the session. Um, or, as he says, it could it could come back which, warrant a lot more time. Which could lead to some tricky interactions between the House. Again, you're talking about the House Speaker really wanting this bill, and it got through the House so quickly. And there's a lot of different things folks want to get done before the end of session, too. So if you're not seeing progress happening in the Senate, what's going to be my motivation to help you guys over in the House when it comes to things like this? Yeah, and the problem with moving something of this scale is the number of stakeholders mm. that are involved in it. And not only do you have the utilities, you have the co-ops, you have large industrial users, you have users like us, residential users, you have uh, new um, independent energy producers that are coming online, solar, et cetera. There's incredible interest in this piece of legislation. And as it's written now, it touches all of those. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a tough thing to, to deal with. Yeah, especially... Yeah, a lot of lobbyists, a lot of money flowing, a lot of folks looking down the road, too, especially when you look at economic development and how this is all tied into growing the state. So we'll well, that's, get, yeah. that's very much a part of it. And it's growing, it's, our growing yeah. state, too, like you mentioned. So yeah. we're glad the Russ McKinney is on top of this, keeping us up to date on what's going on with this. We'll have you back on. we got a couple more days left in session, so we'll see where it goes. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Russ. Goodbye, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, folks, that was the Russ McKinney in studio, but we have a little double dip for you because we're also talking with South Carolina Public Radio's Mayon Schechter. Where's Ms. Schechter been? Mayon, you've been covering another interesting topic at the State House for some time now, and that is judicial reform. <gasps> mm. Yeah. Now, we saw the Senate pass out its bill to the House earlier this year that reforms the Judicial Merit Selection Commission and equalizes voting power within the two chambers. So future candidates will need a majority of the House and the Senate members, not just an overall majority, which favors the House. So uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more about this legislation, where it's going now with just a couple of days left in the session. So that legislation, what the Senate passed is over in the House. There's actually a hearing on Wednesday mm. to take this up. It was supposed to happen last week, but weirdly got bumped to this week. Hmm. What happens to that bill? How does that bill transform? I, I think is really still up in the air. I mean, again, everybody's got a different definition of what judicial reform should be. Everyone has a different take on how far mm -hmm. to to change up the, the vetting committee or change up whether lawmakers even have any say in the process. So I, I don't know right now off the cuff where this legislation goes, but it's really in the House's court right now. The Senate quickly came out the gate, pushed a bill out, did what they felt like was the, the best to do in, in terms of what could get the votes. Sure. And so, you know, the House has been, I think, a little bit more divided on this issue. You've got the Freedom Caucus camp. You've got Democrats who have sort of sided with some of the Freedom Caucus camp. House Republicans have way different uh, feelings about it. But within the House Republican caucus, the main House Republican caucus, there are two there are other divided factions mm. of how far to go. So there's only a few weeks left on yeah. on the calendar. I don't know if this is something that they would put on the signy die special session calendar agenda. 
But which would let them take it up after Sunny Die, which is May 9th, right? May right, 9th, correct, Thursday. May 9th. So they can work on that afterwards, but not whenever everyone's not going to be in session for them to do that, but that's something they can do on their own. Right. I think, you know, the Senate, well, the legislature as a whole was facing a, a bigger deadline because part of the reason why, and uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, mm-hmm. why a bunch of judicial candidate elections were held up was because. Certain senators wanted judicial reform legislation to look a certain way. They they wanted less legislative input, and so they were willing to hold up these elections. Well, the Senate passed legislation that gave these senators some of what they wanted. They just had these judicial elections. So mm-hmm. there's not that sort of deadline. There's not that sort of crush of we need to do something mm-hmm. as there was maybe a few months ago. I mean, obviously, this is something that— A lot of lawmakers, particularly in the House, have been using as a June primary election issue. Mm -hmm. You know, filing's done. Yeah. You know, we're past that. So what happens next? You know, I I use this phrase all the time, remains to be seen. But again, you know, we're a few weeks left in the session. It's hard to say where this legislation goes or if it changes at all. And it would be kind of an easy win, too. I mean, we saw it pass out of the Senate unanimously, too. So Mm -hmm. clearly a lot of support there. It's not what everyone wants it to be. Because that would take a lot more. And it's not saying you can't do more after you pass something like this. But sometimes when a bill like this does get passed, everyone's like, oh, well, we've already done it. We can't revisit the issue. But right. I feel like especially with the upcoming Supreme Court elections, June 12th, the day after the primaries, maybe this could be some sort of, you know, something that kind of ties in with that as well. Right. And I, th- and I think it's rev- I mean, all of it is revolved around together. But I don't think there's going to be it's not going to be a unanimous happy camp with whatever is passed, because there are so many people who want lawmakers completely removed from the process. Mm -hmm. But the leadership has been very clear that that is just not going to happen. And probably after what we saw happen last week when it came to James Smith's nomination for uh, a judicial spot, probably just throws a bigger wrench in all this to kind of tell everyone what happened there uh, during these routine judicial elections last week. Right. So most of the circuit court and other judicial candidate elections were pretty unopposed. There was an appeals race that had three people in it. Uh, but really the one that took all the headlines and has really taken all the headlines for months. I mean, you would have thought it was a Supreme Court race mm-hmm. was this fifth judicial circuit race where James Smith, a former lawmaker who also ran for governor in 2018 against McMaster, was up for election. And he ran unopposed on election day. Mm -hmm. But in this incredibly unprecedented uh, Republican push tactic, Mm -hmm. James Smith is not going to be a judge because they pushed the election, the entire election, back to the Judicial Merit Selection Committee, basically Mm -hmm. told them, reopen the race, bring in new candidates, we'll vet new candidates, because they did not want James Smith to win the race, period. Mm -hmm. Even though he was qualified by the JMSC. Found qualified by the JMSC, very well respected Mm -hmm. in in the legislature. I mean, a lot of House members in particular have served with James. Mm -hmm. They knew James very well. So it wasn't like he was a, a candidate that came out of out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Um, But he was a Democrat. But it's not always just Republicans don't want to put Democratic judges on there. A lot of people were saying he's not only just a Democrat, but he has 20 years of like receipts. And he was also the flag bearer because he was the Democratic gubernatorial candidate. So it's like a little bit more of an uh, intense version of of someone that they could say, maybe we shouldn't be supporting this guy considering that he was you know, running against our guy. Right. And uh, I mean, in some ways, that is that is fair. He's definitely got more of a, a baggage, a, you know, yeah, a baggage, yeah. political baggage than than others. I mean, not many or if any other judicial candidates have run for for governor before. Mm-hmm. But it's not like James Smith was the only political figure to run. A mm-hmm. former lawmaker, Durham Cole, uh, ran for judge and one judge. He's a Republican. But so it, it's not unheard of that these former politicians, former lawmakers have, yeah. have run for judge. But obviously, as you mentioned, James Smith just has much longer tenure in the House. And then he's got that stint running for governor. And, mm-hmm. and that obviously changes the dynamics for a lot of people. And again, yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that there was a lot of pressure coming from the House Freedom Caucus. Mm-hmm. We are an election year. All of that plays yeah. together. Abortion, that was part of this. It all plays together. The Supreme Court, as you mentioned, all plays together. Mm-hmm. And my own, just uh, wrapping up here, going back to the drawing board, 
uh, for that race, of course. But then also on the calendar for June 12th, like we mentioned, is an election for the state Supreme Court vacancy following the mandatory retirement of Chief, Chief Justice Donald Beatty at the end of June. Again, diversity is going to be on the, uh, the minds of a lot of folks in the legislature since South Carolina is the only state with an all-male high court. And with the retirement of Beatty, it will be an all-white male Supreme Court, Mm -hmm. depending on how the legislature votes and who is qualified. So what's that race looking like right now and what can we expect there? So May 9th, Sunny Die is also the first JMSC hearings over the Supreme Court opening. There are three men. They're all white. There are three women, two of whom are African-American. And three of them are going to be put up as candidates to the floor for the full General Assembly to vote on. As you mentioned, there is a lot of attention that's going to be paid on the fact that there were two women who ran for the open seat last go, who Mm -hmm. both withdrew and then Gary Hill was elected. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on lawmakers to revisit the fact that there are no women Mm -hmm. on the court. But yes, the the lack of of someone of color, of, of, of black justice, will certainly be at the forefront. So... I think it's going to be very interesting to see who the three. I wouldn't be surprised if two women, one got out. But mm-hmm. as these things kind of go, it's likely that we will see candidates withdraw and then a candidate run unopposed. That yeah. happens a lot out of, you know, respect. People know where the votes are going to Start be before Election Day. Mm-hmm. Right. So will we have all three candidates on the gra- on the floor? I-, I don't know. I don't think a lot of people like to be embarrassed like that. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a lot of attention. This is a high-stakes Supreme yeah. Court race. And again, that will be the day after the June 11th primaries. So, Right. We could have a lot of unhappy people coming back to the state house <laughs> voting on a Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah. You lose your primary. You're like, why? why? Why should I even bother? Why should I show up? Yeah, but do you know who will be there? All? Do you know who will be there, my own Schechter? We will. We will be there. We will be there. We will be there. <laughs> Dedic- hashtag dedication. I think, yeah. And we'll have a long night, too, covering the primary on air. So just an example of our selflessness. Thank you, my own Schechter. Thank you, Gavin Jackson. <laughs> Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. A.T. Shire's here with me. Thank you. Yes, I am. I am I'm here. singing the wind down today. Gavin, he's just been in a melodious I've mood. I've been melodious. Mm-hmm. Ma, 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 Melody's just melody. flying out of him. It's just, it's we're scary, gonna, honestly. We're going to harmonize everything. Hi-ya. Hi-ya. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, a stinker. He stepped on that one. <laughs> 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 Wait, maybe we should. You see me sing karaoke. You know my karaoke. Step, you, yeah. you know my powers. You do a real, uh, <laughs> like a walk and talk song. You know more you than know, a sing comes, song. It comes with the territory. Real right? walk and talk. I want song. to engage the listener who's forced to hear people scream these songs. Yes, the scream singing. It is a lot. Uh, I would say Gavin. He owns the stage mm. when he sings. Uh, these boots are made for walking. Give presence. At least, hey, at least I can hear myself. I'm not tone deaf. Yeah, you know, you're, I can modulate my voice. It's a talk song. You're doing great. You, you got some friends that, that can't and they want to sing so badly. And you're like, oh, you're just monotone. Yeah, you're picking. Don't maybe don't sing. My heart will go on. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, maybe something with a, a little bit of a deeper, yeah. deeper voice. Yeah, there. yeah. Less, uh, less uh, range. You know what I mean? Like that's a that's a big bite. You're, yeah, you're, especially you're when after. you've seen like you know how many octaves I have. Five yeah, and octave I, I've seen like I've seen him shatter so. glasses. Yeah. I mean, he does it for fun. He throws his voice. Anyway, Gavin, we've gotten a <laughs> few calls that have similar uh, messages. So we're going to pick one to represent the whole thing. So mm. are you ready for uh, basically the only topic we got calls on this weekend? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my name is Mac Harrelson. I live in Florence, South Carolina. Concerning the $1.8 billion, y'all cannot seem to find where it came from. I think that money probably belongs to the citizens of the state of South Carolina, and I think it should be divided between the citizens, just the taxpayers. Everybody should get the same share amount. That's where the money should go. It be used for anything else, because that is probably the citizens of South Carolina's money. Thank you. Mac, yeah, thanks for calling. I think a lot of people are thinking the same way you were about that, sending that money back, that $1.8 billion that we this was the focus of our podcast on Saturday. Yeah. There's going to be a lot going into this. It's not going to be like as quick as that would have been the case, and who knows where it even belongs. I mean, that money belongs to something. It was allotted it was allocated for to something. something. So yeah. uh, I, I wish it could be that easy, because if it was that easy, AT, yes, we'd Gap. all be getting... We did some math. I did some back of a napkin math. We have we have a it's giant a machine <laughs> that has that has rods and cones and reels. Beep, beep. 
in <laughs> vacuum tubes. Yeah, we started it. We started it uh, before the end of the the last episode, <laughs> and as we walked in today, it spit out the a long ticker tape. Yes, I mean a long one. I think I might have put the. And so, Gavin, what's it. our numbers? So we did one point eight billion dollars divided by. At the time, at the the over eighteen uh, population in our state is about four million based on the twenty twenty census. So you divide one point eight billion by four, everyone gets about a little like under four hundred fifty dollars. So yeah, not not four hundred forty four. It's not it's not to sneeze at, but it's not like life changing cash. Yeah, and I think some good walking around money. The biggest news about this money for the pod, at least, is this was the first time. That Gavin did math correctly, and I didn't. I, I didn't want to bring it up. But it you, hurt. You brought it up. I at first, when we were just doing by the by the population, five point two million in the state. I may have made it five point two billion. Yes, <laughs> I see what you did there. Did a few powers of ten off, you know. Well, your your back of the envelope was not as big as my envelope. Back, it was. So that's why it's was it's embarrassing, but I do want to be transparent. Well, then I was like, ATI. I think it's like he was. I think it's three hundred sixty, and you're like, no, it's thirty six cents. <laughs> I'm like, I think it's more than that. Yeah, but it was, was so far nervous. too polite to correct me. <laughs> he was like scared for me, I think. Well, a little I, bit. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you're the math brain. You have the math brain. And I'm like, uh, but, but you were just doing basically like 1.8 divided by like five. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's, and then I'm like, well, that's a B and that's an M. <laughs> But again, we're still, there's going to be a whole forensic audit, essentially, to figure out where this money came from, who it belongs to, where it's going to go. There's going to be so much time for more ideas about how they should spend it when they're not going to do any of that. And because, I mean, the phrase forensic audit, that doesn't that just sound terrible? <laughs> I, if you're a forensic auditor, give us a shout. Why do you do what you do? Did you just like a challenge? Yeah, I, I, I don't like the sound of that. Anyway, Gavin, speaking of uh, things taking and not giving back, uh, my... <laughs> oh. <laughs> my future child. Um, so this weekend, I don't know what you did. I actually I do, but we'll get to that in a second. But uh, what I did was I put uh, baby seats into my car and Aww. built a stroller all weekend. Dad alert. Yeah, and it was like, uh, it's, we were basically getting as close to an argument as we possibly could, me and Caitlin. Over over building a stroller? Trying to follow directions when things oh, are, the, don't, don't go together The marital perfectly. team building exercise. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, we didn't, we didn't argue. We didn't, but it was, we, terse. It was as close as you get before you start. Uh, anyway, Gavin, you, 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 you stretched your entire body this weekend, right? <laughs> yeah, I got suckered into doing Pilates Monday morning. Mm, mm. Honestly, if you saw, you think it's a scam, right? Yeah, I think it's just physical therapy. <laughs> I think I just did what you did. You've been doing for months and years because of your yeah. your torn Achilles. Two years almost. Um, because there were moments I'm like, oh, the AT really would have benefited from this. And then I'm like, wait a minute, he's been doing this. <laughs> I love uh, that I'm top of mind while you're while you're in there. Well, you know, health is wealth. We've always preached that on this podcast, and yeah. I'm I'm a firm believer of that. And after a long weekend, you're like, okay, let's, you know, elongate the spine a little bit. Mm -hmm. And after, ever since uh, Kirsten Wig did the SNL, which she hosted, her fifth time hosting, and she did a whole, like, skit about hey, being baby. a- Hey, mama. Hey, mama's doing, like, the uh, <laughs> the Pilates instructor. I'm like, yeah. okay, like, I want to lean into this. I've I've known plenty of people have done it, so I got roped into going Monday morning. Honestly, not that bad. I'm flexible. I can touch my toes. Same, I can, I can, same. I can do these things. Um it's a challenge. It was nice. It was different. I like to complement my current workout routine, so that was nice. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll sparingly do it. I wasn't. I wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because you're not like jumping off and doing like 20 squats and then doing 20 push-ups and like you're not doing that stuff. You're yeah. just like controlling your movements more and like keeping that core tension going. It, it honestly looks a little bit like a gentrified version of uh, that medieval torture rack yes. where they where they stretch you real hard. You're so vulnerable. You I will say you're vulnerable at times. <laughs> You put a lot of trust in your own body, so uh, you learn some things. But honestly, I mean, you know, if you've ever done like body pump or any of those like classes, you realize that it's you can be as as swole as you think you are. Mm. But when you do those little things over and over again, like it takes a lot out of you. So, well, uh, Gavin, I do believe Health that well. this episode is fully swole. So, oh. <laughs> release <laughs> release the tension. Say the outro. Please call in. Don't yell about the one point eight billion dollars anymore, please. Anything else? Until though. until we know what they're gonna do. Can with we it. get someone to talk about Top Chef or how good the strawberries are right now? Coddle Strawberry shout out. Anyway, Gavin, say goodbye. That's where the governor's press conference is tomorrow. Maybe I'll go and get some strawberries. So if you have some strawberries, you can always send us some produce to 1041 George Rogers Boulevard, care of A.T. Shire, Gavin Jackson. Or if you don't want to send us produce, you can send us a voicemail at 803-563-7169 like Mac did. 
Or heck, just leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'll take that too. And you can stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week by checking out SCETV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. By Lamos. Let the rhythm take you over, guys, okay? How dare you conflate those two? How <laughs> dare you? Hey, by Lamos, okay? Um, can you talk to him? 